Monsters, a common feature that ties all MMORPGs together, and also a common area that breaks role-playing immersion for me. There isn't a lot of choice when it comes to interacting with monsters. In the MMORPG genre, they mainly walk back and forth in an area, infinitely respawning for players to kill. They are tied to quests, where each player hunts and collects quest items, all for the same storyline that's somehow canon for each player. Ignoring hordes of monsters in the open world has no real consequence in the game world, so they don't really feel like a threat, no matter what lore the game tries to throw at you, and players often just maneuver around them if they aggro or straight across them if they don't. There are more dynamic monster encounters, like in dungeons or raids. In these instances, there are unique attack patterns and players have to disengage and engage traps, puzzles, and rotate movement, defensive, and offensive methods to defeat these monsters. Because of this, it's often the goal to get past the slog of quests, NPC dialogue that everyone skips, and grinding to get to end game content, to get to these dynamic monster encounters as soon as possible. And so, open world monsters are not an entertaining concept anymore, and more of an obstacle to get to end game content. More MMORPGs are recognizing that dynamic fights like raids and bosses help to keep players engaged and integrate some special battles in the open world and allow players to fight in instances sooner. Despite this progress, I can't help but think, could we have monsters exist more dynamically in the open world as well, so they aren't just moving back and forth in a specific area in a field? Also, there aren't many character moments when it comes to role-playing and monsters, other than the player's fighting style and if they win or lose, which essentially makes all the players fighters with different styles. And that doesn't feel like a true role-playing experience to me. I would like to create a game where the player can be more than just a fighter, in a way that feels less of a secondary option if that's what they're aiming for and create instances where monsters can give players feedback on their progress, whether they're a farmer, smith, innkeeper, bartender, or any class of fighter. But how would a game integrate monsters into the world that allows variances for these different roleplay experiences? In this episode, I'll show you how this could be possible. And as always, these are ideas for anyone to take and use for their own projects. If you haven't yet, I would recommend at least seeing the prior episode before this one, since it's building off of it. But this video can work as a standalone itself as well, so by all means feel free to continue. We'll put a timestamp so you can choose to skip the last episode summary if you desire. In summary, in the last episode, we discussed how players can create and utilize different types of properties. Players can essentially build anywhere if they have the resources, but players can have one protected area which keeps your resources protected from other players. Players start with basic building recipes like a shelter, and upon collecting more resources and building, they unlock the ability to construct larger buildings. Solo players can build alone, and player communities can build close together. This all occurs in an open world and not in a separate housing instance. Players can store resources, display items, grow crops, and care for animals they collect in the world. Nature-based players can use their protection spell on a befriended but untamed wildlife creature, giving them access to powers of nature. They accumulate resources in small hidden areas in the wild, or small nature buildings that don't scare off wildlife. They will tend to their herd, pack, or flock. They can work together or alone to change the environment and set passive buffs that affect themselves and the wildlife. Regions will have their own resource types based on their themes and territories, where travelers will construct different buildings than locals or natives in an area, so there are clear visual histories between players who started at that location and players who moved to that location from another territory or region. With all that said, in this episode we'll discuss how each of these player types will attract different monsters that relate to their role-playing choices, adding another layer to these role-playing experiences. So let's get started. Player properties like buildings, mounts, and vehicles can be set as a player's safe point by using a protection spell. Players can set these protected areas as a resurrection point if they die, as long as there's a campfire or a mantle. 
Because these areas are protected from other players and can be resurrection points, it will be more likely that players will collect and store resources at their properties, even if just at first. Because safe points are a natural area to accumulate resources, players don't need to think about what archetype they're trying to aim for. They can just do whatever interests them, and the resources and items they collect, craft, wear, and use will make up their role-playing archetype. For example, fishers will amass fish and fishing equipment themed to their local region or terrain near fishing areas, and smiths will do the same with raw ore resources, smithing tools, armor, and weapons, or whatever mix the player decides on. This will be guided gently by players unlocking new crafts as they start off with small primitive ones and unlock new recipes as they use their items and discover new items. And this is the basis for how we will integrate monsters into the world. Every resource in Spirit Relics has a spirit value, set in the game through number values and tags. These are separate from the item stats. For example, an apple would heal HP, but would also be tagged with food spirit. A sword would have its equipment stat values and be tagged with combat spirit. A multi-tooled item like an axe, while it can be used as a tool or a weapon, could be tagged with either gathering spirit for cutting logs or combat spirit for combat. It can be used for either instance, but its appearance and tag will help dictate what it is better suited for. Living creatures like fauna will also have their own spirit for each species class. Resources will have different spirit worth, and values will increase with stats, crafting, and history tags. Like a stronger weapon will have more combat spirit than a weaker weapon. In crafting, combining foreign items or old and ancient items can further increase spirit value. A combination of these things will stack value. Also, simple, easy crafting recipes have less spirit, and complex recipes will have more. Please note that all of the designs and number values are just placeholders for now. As these items and creatures are accumulated, the players are amassing spirit, and monsters are attracted to spirit, since they need to consume it. The types and quantity of spirit is what tracks what kinds of monsters and how many. Note that players won't literally see spirit like this, but I hope this helps visualize calculations that are happening in the background of player activity. Each protected building will tally all the spirit in its protected radius, so it would also include items inside buildings. Players can increase their property size over time by unlocking and constructing larger buildings or unlocking and building fields and fences for farming, ranching, or otherwise, until max size. Each non-protected building will have a generic radius that will also count total spirit, and this will be based on the size of the building. Aside from buildings, campfires not attached to buildings, vehicles, and market stalls will work the same as buildings, having a radius around it, although smaller. So, in summary, all of these areas will have a total amount of spirit as depicted here, as well as other counters for spirit types like combat, food, and resource types like wood and stone. Every creature will count everything equipped on it like bags, armor, and weapons, but won't be umbrellaed under buildings so they'll be counted separately. Wild herds and packs will all count creatures in their group even if they aren't close enough. Domesticated creatures will count all the spirit in an enclosure or post, as well as their own individual counts as well. Each player will also be able to quickly swap and toggle between three loadouts. These can be full equipment changes if you want them to be at a simple click of a button. The player's spirit will be the total equipment count, plus your inventory. This would include all sets on your character, not just the active one. Players can also equip passive NPC-like clothing to negate some monster tension if they prefer to work on their farm, inn, fishing, or other crafts, as well as carrying or equipping repelling charms, tools, and setting these things inside their home, wagon, tools, or mounts. With all this in mind, a player who is a farmer may attract monsters that like to eat a lot due to the crops on their land and crops stored in mills, crates, and barrels. At first, small ones that are maybe similar to raccoons, and later on, maybe more like bears. Ranchers, due to fauna on their land, may attract things like foxes, wolves, and cougars. Smiths, miners, and cave dwellers, 
whether they be nomadic or settlers, could attract rock, crystal, and metal-based golems, or hungry giant worms due to ores, crystals, and the crafts that they make. A variety player would potentially attract all sorts of monsters. Depending on the studio's budget, some monsters may have multi-purpose, like an omnivore bear-like monster could still attack ranchers, farmers, and nomads alike, but ideally, many monsters should feel unique so that player archetypes are getting feedback from the monsters as to what their archetypes are leaning towards. These monsters should be themed towards their local region, like a rocky region would have rocky-themed monsters and a forest-themed region would have forest-themed ones. If not obviously themed, at least unique to that area. Territory subsections, if included in the game design, should also have some of their own unique monsters. Since monsters are attracted to spirit, some monsters will have certain appetites. Items can emit regional values that monsters will be attracted to, no matter the item's physical location. So let's say a player from a desert region brings back a seed from a foreign land or purchased them through trade. If successful in planting and growing them, players will have new resources in their desert biome but they may start attracting these foreign monsters if they accumulate too much. Few resources would probably not be noticeable, other than maybe a couple of rats or bird pests the players haven't seen before. There will be some strategy to consider, where some monsters need to exist in certain biomes. For example, there may need to be enough water for oceanic or swampy monsters to spawn, and can't appear in desert regions even if the spirit allocation calls for it. And some monsters may surprise players by responding to these foreign terrains in different ways, possibly by making small clusters of resources that can alter the area to mimic other biomes. Since this is all based on resources players accumulate, it can scale up and down naturally. The challenge will scale up as players collect more resources, construct bigger buildings, and gain stronger equipment, and so forth. It will scale down as they lose resources to monster attacks and destruction. Doesn't matter if a player is solo based or if it's a small village, town, or busy city. A player who is content with a certain property size and amount of resources can have a more predictable, casual experience and can scale up in the future if they do feel the itch for it or not. They can enjoy a small cabin, garden, and a local pond for fishing and live a casual, no high stakes life. Players can also strategize using storages with special values that hide spirit like repelling charms or repelling infused covers for storages. The effect may stack with adjacent camo, but will lose effectiveness next to non-camouflaged industrialization. For example, if in the middle of a city and a single building was the only one with camo. Incorrect camo for the terrain type will decay quickly and will be destroyed automatically and will be a waste of time and resources. So use a little common sense based on the area you're in. This is the same for camouflage used in the middle of industrialized zones. Repelling charms and camouflage in general can create visuals for other players that help indicate desired monster activity in two different ways. These can also be mixed together. Players who utilize this can focus on other aspects of the game like crafting, engaging with the community, or traveling to far off lands with less worry about monster attacks or just personal preference. Players who roleplay together may not even need to utilize this if players help each other to clear the threats, which we'll talk about later in this episode. Groups of players in settlements will have shared responsibility for monsters. While it's targeting a building, there may be other casualties due to living so close to others. Monsters will do the most damage on buildings that are the target, and less so on other buildings. But players can help assist in reconstruction to help perpetuate their town's existence. More secluded buildings won't have to worry about neighboring attacks as often, but may still encounter some monster issues depending on some circumstances happening in the world. Settlements will also have specific settlement-themed threats due to the larger accumulation of spirit. However, both settlers and solo players can strategize the placement of defensive walls, use bait, set traps, and place hired NPC in strategic areas if they want. There will be many options for players to minimize adjacent damages, and settlements will unlock special building recipes to aid them with this. Settlers will need to work together to clear these threats both strategically in battle as well as the placement of their structures. 
Solo players will need to rely on their own strength, construction, and planning. If abandoned completely and no reconstruction is done, in the case of defeat or player abandoned locations, nature will slowly reclaim these areas to make room for future players, and can be a cluster for wildlife resources until players clear the area for construction. At your property's hub or player core menu, you can see your personal upcoming threats. A settlement hub will show settlement specific threats and will also alert players with assigned roles like generals, captains, soldiers, and guards if a threat activates at a specific building or is impending for the whole settlement. As mentioned in prior episodes, these cores are user interfaces that the user interacts with but your character will also open a runic looking screen in the game as well. At either of these menus, you can review the timer countdown to when a monster threat will arrive. When they arrive, they'll spawn from the sky, ground, sea, or otherwise in a radius around their target, and they will travel towards it. Whenever the player is ready to clear the threat, they can summon the monster threat at their property hub or core menu at any time. In settlements, allowed players like founders, council members, generals, and captains will be allowed to start threats. It'll be up to the settlement founders and council on how they want to organize roles. Solo players can just do it whenever they want. This makes it so that players don't have to be online at a certain time and they can start when they are ready or have enough players to be ready. However, when the timer runs out, the monster will appear, whether the player or settlement is ready or not if they've not cleared the threat beforehand. There will be periods of peace in between threats, whether you win or lose. At any time, you can see what threats you may encounter. This is indicated by a percentage, with 100% monsters being the guaranteed next threat. But eventually, after a threat is cleared and the period of peace runs out, your hub will mark your new impending threat. By default, the next threat will consider monsters you've already defeated and will give a percent boost to monsters you haven't fought yet if you meet the criteria for them. Collecting more of the spirit that attracts them will also increase the possible threat percent, but there are more ways to influence this. There can be other adjustments based on player feedback, but we also want to give some of this power into player hands at all times. Players can offer items as a means to adjust their current encounter or queue up a bunch of monsters. At your property hub, you'll be presented with a list of monster threats you've already encountered that may appear again and the percent chance, and you can select which one or ones you want to edit. To make this number lower, assign repel, and to make these number higher, toggle attract. Allowed players with roles like captains, generals, or other edited roles, maybe like a shaman or otherwise, will be allowed to adjust encounters at settlement hubs. You can also add or remove effects like adding more minion monsters in the next encounter, at the cost of more spirit. Minions are small monsters or adds. There are other options I would like to add as well, but I'd like to see how this plays out first as a starting point. Monster parts of the monster you are trying to affect will be counted as more effective than other items. If these items become crafted like food or weapons, it will stack that bonus as crafted spirit. This is an exaggerated example, but you get the idea. If you have foreign items, these will also be considered rarer than your starting area and thus will be worth more spirit. Players can also craft and discover other things that can help support them further, with crafted items stacking bonuses based on the items used to make them. Older items and ancient items will stack spirit as well, except food items, which is worth more when they're fresh. The player character will hold their hand toward the fire with their hands glowing with magic, and the items you selected will be burned immediately after clicking and holding for long enough. As more spirit is needed for the change, it will take longer to click and hold to accept. Removing hold at any time before this is complete will cancel burning the items. You can toggle the speed of this hold at your user settings if you're prone to accidents or would like it to go faster. If you don't select a monster, you can store the spirit value in a vault. Vaults will generally look like ovens and will function as a bank vault for spirit. Just remember that this value is still on your property and is still counted towards the count that can attract monsters. This extra spirit keeps your protection spells on for longer since it will be used when your tinder runs out. This way, players don't always have to cut trees down, chop logs, and collect branches, and instead use items they've crafted to keep their fires alive. Also, it is very useful for players who plan on being offline for a long time and want to keep their properties protected from other players and keep it from decaying. 
extra spirit you keep can be used to repel and attract monsters later. You can light torches, candles, and other fire sources with extra spirit to trade and gift other players, to light and rekindle other protection fires, or be gifts for friends to help them fill their vaults. Spirit can also be used to refill magic meters. Spirit is just like a fire, and even when not in use, it will slowly deplete over time in a vault or on a candle or torch. Since these will count towards total spirit count, players will need to be able to defend these locations if they decide to hold large amounts of spirit. Settlements and solo players can flaunt their power for maintaining large amounts of spirit, but also need to be strong and coordinated to keep the display up. So we talked about monsters attracted to properties, but what about the open world itself? In the prior episode, we talked about resource clusters. I really want to come up with a different name for this, but I'm not smart enough. If you have an idea, please leave a comment and help me out. A cluster is an area group that has resources, and they come in different varieties. For example, different trees and bushes, or maybe a field of flowers and so forth. Over time, a cluster can grow and sprout more resources. At map creation, some wildlife creatures will exist in the world, and the clusters will help perpetuate them since clusters can also spawn wildlife. Clusters can continue to spawn creatures as long as they meet a health criteria for it, and existing creature quantity is an at max. The max quantity is based on the cluster size and health. We might tinker with max and low population rules in a grid square area and other coded rules, but we'll figure something out. If the grid total isn't at max population and a cluster is able to, it will periodically create a new solo creature. Even though I'm using a deer in this example, this will hold true for predator type creatures as well. Wildlife creatures will travel from cluster to cluster. These spawned creatures will usually function to help spread a resource or destroy resources they feed on or use. They will have action cooldown, so they won't do these at every cluster. Players can decide, based on creature actions and creature loot, if they are considered a pest or if they are vital to keep alive, to keep some types of resources more or less common. When in a cooldown state and not being attacked, they can idle at a cluster they are compatible with and may even rest there. They will move on and continue traveling if they are not compatible with the cluster type. If they are solo or a herd, pack, or group leader, they will rest when they return to a cluster they spawned from. There will be a traveling cooldown, so once they are away from their resting point for too long, they will return back and rest. If they don't make it back in time, they will enter an exhausted state and will attempt to rest wherever they are before trying to return back again. As seen in this example, when collecting resources such as eating, these will be lootable from their stomachs when killed. Some items will only be available if you approach them and collect them off the creature without killing them. Some may be more potent the longer it and the creature are left alone. Perhaps maybe a fungus used for potions growing on a creature's back. Other times they may disappear. For example, a bear might eat some honey off of a tree, but if you loot the bear's stomach after some time, the honey may turn into a hardened ore amber. But wait too long and it will time out due to digestion. Digestion will pause while combat is active, so players will not be unnecessarily rushed if they know a monster has something they want. We can consider this due to a redirection of the creature's energy resource. They are focused on fighting and not digestion. Wildlife can encounter the same species during their pathfinding, and they can start pathfinding together. I'll be calling these a group for now, but you can consider this a pack, herd, or flock depending on the species. The oldest of the group will gain a leader flag in the code if there isn't one set on the other creature in the encounter. The assigned leader will now be followed by other solo same species that are encountered and will compete with other leaders. For now, we plan on the group only doing one action when reaching a resource cluster, like eating or spreading a resource, but that might change in the future. One option of consideration is, for each creature in the group, they will have a percent chance of doing another action, but will perform one action at a time, and the chain of actions will stop if one of the creatures fail, and with each chained success, the chance of another action succeeding will drop. 
As mentioned before, predators will work similarly, moving from cluster to cluster and having their own origin point cluster, where they'll spawn from. But when colliding with prey in sight range, the leader of a group, or solo predator, will select a random target and will have a percent to be successful if in range of a kill. Kill failure will point their pathfinding to their resting cluster so they can recover. They won't hunt every collision just when the hunting cooldown ends and prey is in sight. If they don't hunt, depending on the prey's comfort zone, if they get too close, the prey will still flee. There are other coded behaviors we can add, but this is a good starting point. Trees, bushes, flowers, and so forth can spread their own resources over time without external aid from creatures or players. A special note here that spirit relics ores function like mushrooms, where a single ore can sprout more ore and mineral veins over time if the environment allows them to grow. They will crack and become unusable if they can't sustain themselves. Over time, as clusters get bigger and age, older resources will level up and become larger, and will have more spirit value. So resources can be spread by nomads, as mentioned in episode 4, by their own from not being harvested, and by creatures in the open world itself, or by players manually tending for them like watering trees or placing mineral seeds like ores in caves. Each of these flora, materials, and creatures will have their own wild spirit counts. The total calculation of these will determine which chance of a monster will nest in this location. This will occur both during the initial shard creation, then afterwards in timed cycles in random locations. The game will prioritize grids that don't have properties built on them first. Nested monsters won't nest in clusters, but in a cleared area. If there is no room, they will destroy resources to make room. Monsters in the wild will travel between clusters similar to predators, but most smaller creatures from it will be considered prey. Creatures will set new resting points if their original one is too close to a monster they aren't compatible with. So your typical hunting grounds may shift when a monster creates a nest in the wild. Restoring a solo or group of creatures cluster is a quest option that we'll explore in a future episode. Not just monsters though, wildlife will also not rest, visit, or spawn from clusters near player properties that are too industrialized. When your property is marked for an attack by an open world monster, you'll be alerted of the imminent threat. Open world monsters can break typical periods of peace since they are functioning as a unique entity as compared to monsters attracted to player properties. As the monster ages, meaning it's not killed and is persisting for a long time in the open world, it will be able to summon more minions, and players may receive more threats. Some monsters and minions may alter the resources around them, similar to wildlife creatures that spread trees or ores. Over long periods, this can create special biomes if these creatures are kept alive long enough for special crafts and resources. It will be up to players to decide if they want to create conservation zones to allow monsters to persist or consider them pests. Players can also unlock shrines to monsters and wildlife alike, which will make them stronger than usual to deter attackers. These shrines will be another area where players can get quests to aid specific creatures or a general category of creatures, but for less of an effect. These shrines will be unlocked as players feed them with offerings at altars and make special sacrificial crafts that are solely used for offerings. This will lead to some player conflicts as some may consider certain monsters as pests, others revered, maybe even culturally important to crafting and building aesthetics in a unique biome, and surely some just financially useful may be dead or alive depending on if they want the corpse or if they want the resource it spreads. Players and NPC will be attacked when encountered during their pathfinding cycles if monsters, minions, and predators are actively hunting. Players can also control threats outside of properties and settlements to some degree. Since monsters, minions, and predators can still be encountered at camps, wagons, and during their travels, players can hold on to repelling charms, holding items that lure them, or using yelling skills after defeating some to attract more or scare off the rest. Players can also wear passive spirit clothing that looks like regular clothes that can help negate some or all combat spirit. 
robes themed towards specific monsters of worship will deter attacks from that specific monster, even if other party members are being attacked, but only if you've been religious enough. Despite any player's successful attempt to be passive, monsters will still engage in combat if attacked. Players may want to strategize traveling so that they have a safe point nearby, either inns, restaurant, churches, or fortresses that players can use in between locations, or a respawn and healing wagon that will park away from combat in case of player death. In the case of grids with desolation, meaning no wildlife resources or wildlife are within an area, Meteor seeds can fall and repopulate the land in some instances. These meteors will appear on player and settlement threats if they end up being close to player properties, but will prioritize empty grids first, and players can perform special actions to keep these from falling if they don't want them. Players can also make their threats open for other players to join. Players can create beacons at which the monsters can be summoned to it when activated. It can also signal other players of active threats or threats they have accepted, with individual visibility options based on player wants and needs for quests and points of interest. While you can also summon monsters at any time at allowed properties, core hubs, and settlements, you can set a beacon on and off your property, and beacons can allow other players to clear your threat queue when you're offline. And if you would like to do other tasks instead of clearing your threat queue, players who don't want more support can tap the beacon off at any time while the threat is active. This will mark it as complete, but the beacon will turn on again and reopen the quest if everyone present in the fight falls in battle. When the battle is cleared, the beacon will still turn off automatically. The farther away from your property, the more tinder your protection spell needs to keep the beacon active. By placing the beacon farther or closer away from a property gives players more agency of their style of engagement. Properties can be bases for battles or focused on passive living. Players can keep monsters out of structures, within structures, or away from structures. Just remember that if the queue is not cleared in time, they will appear at the beacon. They will then head for the property or area that attracted it after destroying the beacon. Monsters activated publicly through a beacon will be allowed to be looted publicly even if it dies on the owner's private property. Players can either clear threats as they come across beacons, or they can see quest postings to gain the option to mark them on their map and see the beacon light in the world. The owner of the beacon can set rewards to try to entice players. We'll go into more detail in a future quest-specific episode, but I will cover some of this today. Players will also be able to convert whatever rewards are set to previously encountered raw resources if the spirit values are equal or less, and are in the matching region or territory biome for it. There will be limitations to this, but it helps players clear quests for other players, while giving them more rewards that are relevant to their own personal goals, despite what monster is appearing. Otherwise, players can also opt to convert it to spirit that they can then drop off at their vault for more protection time, threat management, magic replenishment, or to pay hired NPC. Players can choose via the building recipe for a beacon if it is just for their own threats or if others can link to it as well. This is shown visually as a single beacon for the owner only, and multi-beacons for public shared threats. This way, players can organize more threats in one area. In our prior example, it could be that fortresses and arenas handle all monster threats for citizens who don't want threats near their area at all. Each character will need to offer their own cost in Tinder to keep this connection active. This can open more players to have more freedom of movement on their properties. At a multi-beacon, players ready to clear a threat can select which threat and how many to activate, with the soonest arrivals appearing on top. In settlements, it can be set so only allowed players can start threats. The more monsters cleared at a time will produce extra spirit rewards. I also think it would be great for allowed players to open a vote on which threat encounter will be summoned. The winning choice will be summoned when enough players signal they are ready, which is shown visually as players raising their current weapons. 
Note that in Spirit Relics, there is no auto group finding button and no class requirements for any encounters since players can just equip whatever armor or weapons they want. This may raise some eyebrows, but I promise we will cover a brand new combat system in another video. Placing an altar at a single or multi beacon will create another engagement option, appeasing the threat. Monsters can come and consume their need for a spirit at the altar as long as they aren't engaged in combat. They can take their fill, leave, and the threat will be considered cleared until the next cycle. Larger altars and more spirit value will be needed for larger monsters. Monsters will destroy these things for spirit value, or if compatible, they will eat them. They won't eat container items like crates and barrels, just the items within them but will destroy them once emptied if not yet satisfied. Eaten items will function similarly as discussed before with wildlife, where other players can loot these when they are defeated. Also, since these monsters aren't dead, they will appear later again or against other players elsewhere and will retain these items. And still over time, and if not engaged in combat, these will revert into raw materials and eventually disappear. If not satisfied, monsters will destroy the altar and anything left and the beacon before it will head to the original property that attracted it if nothing is there to stop it. If a monster is partially satisfied and it does successfully attack property, it will do less damage since it doesn't need to collect as much spirit to be full. Altars give players an option to use their crafts, harvests, and trades as a means to clear their challenges. A smith could offer their crafts, a trader their goods, and so forth. For live offerings like sheep or cattle, blood will stain the altar, but can be cleaned up if players don't like that aesthetic. Keeping it will leave a violent and savage appearance. Players will still need to feed live offerings to keep them alive if left there for too long, or can return them to fields, barns, or other shelters in between threats. If a player kills a monster with animals tethered to a beacon for a sacrifice, the quest poster can add an additional quest to return live offerings back to barns and fields for another reward. In offline mode, you can set the threat cycles to pause or continue when the game is closed. Since players can make traps, it may be that a player wants to keep the threats coming while they're eating dinner, but later on want to keep it paused while they're at work. In this instance, you can change these settings at any time at your property hub and your core player menu or the offline game title screen. If a monster ends up in a near defeat, but it takes too long to defeat in the weakened state, the monster's fear meter will start to increase. The monster may attempt to flee and may rest in the open world and create a nest. The threat will be cleared, but the monster is technically not defeated. There will be limitations to this though. If it cannot or will not nest in the open world, it will return as a threat with partially healed HP, but will appear sooner and will stack with other already queued up threats. You can also craft items that may disorient and scare a monster in a weakened or nearly appeased state so that it will flee quicker, like flash bombs, sonic blasts, and firecrackers. These will be less effective when it has high HP. This option is good if you want to strategize keeping the monster alive, or maybe you ran out of potions, offerings, or other resources, and you want a chance to fight or appease them later. Just know that other players may get to it first, if it flees to the open world. But you will be the only player who will know its pinpoint location immediately from your core menu or property hub as a new optional quest. Optionally, you can now post this quest for adventurers as well, so they too will know its pinpoint location. Or you can just let players discover this for themselves. To loot any creature, including monsters, you can use your character's bare hands, meaning nothing is equipped. You will gain generic shreds of meat, hide, and bones with the meat still on it. This is done by pressing and holding interact while your weapons are put away. This is so that while in combat, you won't accidentally loot when you meant to attack especially when there's a sea of bodies around you. This bare hand looting will result in more primitive and rough crafts. By equipping a hunting knife tool, and don't worry, this won't take up a weapon slot, this is a unique tool slot, you can carve a creature in a cleaner fashion. Also by pressing and holding with your weapons put away. This will result in crafts with cleaner aesthetics. With your hunting knife equipped and single tapping interact, instead of pressing and holding, a looting inventory screen will appear. Instead of getting random loot, you can choose specific loot. 
You'll have your different layers, meat, bones, and organs. The stomach and body will have special sections. The stomach is where you can find items they have consumed. If you don't want to collect specific cuts of meat and organs, remember that you can still collect generic cuts of meat, bones, and hide with or without a hunting knife. Ideally, there'll be other knife kits in the world that can help you collect unique things, but if we add these, they need to have clear and useful purpose in the game. Depending on the studio budget, the amount of precision can be designed simply or complex. For example, leg and torso meat cuts or butcher specific meat cuts. Specific bones like skull bones, hoof bones, or should they just be bones? Crafting mechanics need to consider this because if it can be harvested, it should have some purpose to it. Items made from raw creature resources will reflect the creature, like furniture, armor, and weapons. Crafting with more refined resources like iron may hide these features a bit, but retaining some visual history of what is crafted with it will be our goal. With this system, wildlife and monsters may take more time to create due to the equipment, food, and furniture, but less monsters will be needed overall since creatures have more depth and tangibility to them. We want to focus on quality over quantity. Defeating monsters will feel really satisfying when you're creating items that reflect the monsters you've defeated. When you step into a home or encounter a player, you will see a visual history. When there is a feast and a whole cow or a giant tail is being eaten, you'll know it came from a hunt. This will further reinforce region and territory differences, player experiences, and helps create history to all the items seen in the world. While we will cover quests in the future, players can construct bulletin boards that can help guide players to threats, the soonest appearing on top. Active threats will have a visual indicator to show that players are already engaged in the fight. Accepting a quest will pin it on the player's map. Players can filter the threats between regular beacons or ones with altars, but players can still clear threats in their own way. Crafting players can place their own temporary altars, and places that already have altars, combat-based players can just start combat when the monster appears. Rewards will also be posted at bulletin boards and can convert rewards there or at the beacon upon completion. Upon canceling a beacon quest, the game will ask if you would also like to remove it off your map marker. If you say no, you can still remove the pin from your map or maps at any time. Bulletin boards will be a great functional furniture piece to add to an inn, bar, town center, guilds, churches, or your own personal property. Locals and travelers alike can check out bulletin boards around properties, farms, villages, towns, and cities. This isn't all that can be posted at bulletin boards though, and we'll cover quests later. But eventually we'll talk about bounty hunting, where wanted posters will also be posted here. NPC quests will also be posted here as well, just to name a few. Personally, I feel like this system will pose challenges in a way that keeps the world and conflict alive and engaging. This has player progression without a typical leveling system. You can just experience it. Your actions will attract monsters depending on how you play your character naturally. Also depending on player action and inaction. In this way, players end up role-playing without thinking about it because there are situations that are more interpretational on what could be desirable or not. Also, this gives an opportunity for crafting players to clear monster threats in their own way with crafts instead of fighting. Players can have some options on how to engage monsters, repelling or attracting them, or working together as a community to filter monsters to combat-focused players. This gives combat-based players a community to protect, where not everyone is a fighter if they want to be. And if not players, then NPC can fill those roles or everyone can be combat-based. What's the harm in that? Or players can be purely crafters, where they submit their crafts to monsters and keep them at bay. Players can stick to communities or play their own way going solo. Players who don't have any set home, like walking wanderers or ones that travel on mounts, a wagon, with friends or alone, can go from property to property or towns and cities to clear threats that have connections to real people, aside from NPC threats. Essentially, players could actually roleplay as a wandering adventurer in a way that feels more meaningful. Or players can set properties and settlements and enlist other players. It will be up to players if they want to maintain these relationships, or have players come and go, or hire NPC, or just rely on themselves or their friends. All of this will add a whole new level of engagement that I think could respark the MMO genre like never before. Many people are hungry for a world where we can get our daily dose of escapism. We can do that in a world where we can play as a wanderer, farmer, soldier, fisher, smith, or otherwise in a more meaningful way that connects players as a community, even if they decide to solo it. 
because when there are community options, going solo in a world where communities exist can help people find peace in their own way. Alone or together, everyone deserves to feel like they've found their place in the world, even if it's in a fantasy one. And I hope to continue to make videos that will help us to explore new ways to do this. I hope you'll share this video with those who have left the MMORPG realm. If you want next episode updates, everything on the Patreon is public for free. Bookmark it. It's in the description below. Well, I'll see you in the next episode whenever it's ready. Feel free to comment your thoughts and ideas down below. Take care.